Hello, everybody. Randy Catterson here with Boomerosity. Gosh, when I was about 13 or so years old, uh, around 1973, I was hanging around with a guy. He's a little bit older than me and a bit more into a lot different music than I was. And he introduced me to this very interesting band. The band was Uriah Heep, and the album was The Magician's Birthday. And whenever I was hanging with him, we would just listen to that eight track of all things over and over and over again. And since then, I kept up with the band. They were a great band, very sophisticated in their approach to music, very intricate, highly skilled musicians, and know how to put a song together. And though I've never seen them in concert, I'm told that they really put on a tremendous show. So I was made aware that the band was coming out with a new album. In fact, uh, as of this recording, it came out this past Friday. And I have just fell in love with the album and the band all over again. And I had the opportunity to talk with the band's drummer, Russell Gilbrook. We had a lovely chat. Uh, he was over in the UK and me here in the Smoky Mountains of East Tennessee. And we just had a wonderful visit. Found out the backstory about the album, their approach to the music, and what their plans are for the rest of this year, which you'll definitely want to tune in and listen to. So without any further ado, here is Boomerosity's first interview with Uriah Heap drummer, Russell Gilbrook. Until next time, this is Randy Patterson with Boomerosity. Take care. Hey, mate, you're nice and early. Well done. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, so are you. Musicians aren't known to be early, huh? <laughs> no, I'm a drummer. I'm always early. You know, when we go on the road and I'm uh, waiting for the tour bus time or whatever it is, I'm always the one that's down... 15 minutes before everybody else. <laughs> I can relax then. I don't want to be rushing around. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you there, man. I, and road's hard enough without running late, right? Correct. Yeah. So where are you dialing in from? Um, I'm basically in Essex, which is southeast England. Mm -hmm. um, and we escape most of the really bad weather down here so if, it, if, it, if the snow really piles in here we usually get away with it a bit more and if it's nice and sunny we have a little bit more of the sun <laughs> ah, good deal good deal. yeah well i'm in the smoky mountains of east tennessee so that's uh where it's just it's got kind of a, a a british kind of weather here today very rainy and overcast and uh yeah. so it's um but i love it i love it so um How's the post-pandemic world treating you? I, things getting back to normal for you guys? Yeah, definitely getting back. I mean, it hit our industry harder than anyone else. It made things really hard and difficult. And um, it was a slow process getting back. A lot of people lost their livelihoods, their businesses. Um, obviously, the touring was completely flopped. A lot of promoters went bankrupt, but it's getting back now. And obviously people, the thing is music's got such a fantastic connection to people mm -hmm. that they can't wait to get out and see and hear their favorite bands again. So that's the good thing. So yeah, I would say it's, it's probably this year is a year is getting back to normal. I know you guys probably played a little bit, maybe for small groups or something, just to kind of get back in the groove of things. But are you sensing a um, a change in how how shows will be run moving forward, or is it really getting back to the normal it was before the pandemic? Yeah, it's not changed at all, really. It's just a case of um, you, you're going to get a small percentage of people that are still apprehensive on coming out. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've also got, because of our country and the worst government I've ever known in my life, crucifying everybody, um, instead of going to see, say, four or five or six uh, different acts or bands in one month, they have to go to one or two. They have to be more choosy because they haven't got the money to to spend like they used to before. That's the the sad thing, that the the government and the situation has made people be more choosy in their leisure time. And I think that's terrible because yes. we all need, need that in our lives. Uh, uh, 
life isn't about working, working, working till you drop. It's about a balance of working hard, generating your money, and in, in, enjoying things that you like in life. Well, it's like I tell people, uh, we, we work to live, not live to work. You Correct. Know? Unless That's we right. really love what we're doing, and then it's both, right? We, well, you we, do get the workaholics, don't you? You yeah. get. <laughs> I, I've been accused of that a time or two. So, yeah. hey, I've been following Uriah Heap since Magician's birthday, and oh, I always right. love seeing when you guys have an album come out. I know you've been with them for the last what fifteen years or so, yeah, thereabouts. Yeah. And uh, so, so tell me about this new album. I I love what I've heard so far, but tell me the backstory on it. Well, I mean, it was the pandemic that put us in the situation we were in as far as, obviously, the touring was taken away from us, which was very, very hard. Uh, so the only way to be creative was for everybody to get their heads down and do a writing, uh, do a, a nice lot of writing. And we brought all of our ideas together once um, the p pandemic started to lift a little bit we were able to bring all of our ideas together um and then we actually did pre-production which i believe is the best way to do an album anyway you need to do pre-production to fine tune all of the elements of the, the tracks that you might pick or you are going to pick um so we did our pre-production in chapel studios in lincolnshire in the uk which is where we recorded Living the Dream, but we did the pre-production there for two weeks um, with all the ideas. We made our decision on the tracks that we thought were going to be the, the best ones. We then sent those tracks off uh, to the producer who had his, um, you know, his decision on it, what he thought, and the result is Chaos and Colour. Um, and then we went in September, it was... September of 21, we went in to record, no, September 20, yeah, September 21, we went in and uh, recorded it after um, agreeing on the, the tracks, and we were very happy with it, and uh, you hear what it is. You know, one thing I've always noticed about what you guys put out is just, I mean, there's there's no mailing it in, as we say here in the States. You guys... It's always very deliberate, very, I would say, even complex and arrangements and the tightness of the musicianship and that and that type of thing. And from what I've heard so far on this album, I mean, you guys take that to a whole new level. So I I, I mean, I guess it's the pre-production stuff that you mentioned, um, plus just being maybe what doing a lot of having a lot of time to practice and work on your uh work on your chops there a little bit, I would imagine, huh? Well, yes. I mean, that doesn't really become a problem for the band because we do so many shows, you know, so our chops are always quite high. But um, the pre-production part, yes, you can't be... You see, the thing is, it's nice to live with ideas and song ideas and arrangement ideas for a little time because things do change when they start to digest you do have other you know six seven eight different permutations of something mm -hmm. and if you've got the time to experiment a little you can then as i said tweet what the existing idea or song and really try and perfect it so it it uh, comes across in its best manner that is what happened with living a dream and that's what's happened with um chaos and color and that's why we were really quite excited about this album. Living a Dream went down so well, it sent it set the the benchmark for us not to mess up or to produce something quite special. Yeah. Um, and we were biting our nails a little bit, like we always do, because we live with it. We th always think it's great, but yeah. you know the fans and the people that review it. Ultimately, uh, it's their point of view and their um comments that um we rely on and we're so thankful that at the moment they're going mad for this album and it's uh, it really gives you a build, it gives you a lot of confidence knowing that oh we can still do this we can still write some amazing music yep that's right 
what was aside from the pandemic affecting how you guys would collaborate and such um what else was different about putting this album together compared to the other ones you've worked on and what you've you know both with Uriah Heep and anybody else you've you may have worked with on on albums well i think that you know i've got four songs on the album with uh, an amazing guitarist buddy of mine has been a mate of mine for over 30 years um this is the first time i've actually written since my involvement for 15 nearly 16 years now um so that is the difference and that must be hard for mick and phil as well to put the trust you know we're very experienced musicians we know a great song when we hear one but as i said it's not about us it's about the record company liking it the fans liking it the yeah. reviewers liking it but it's nice to um have that involvement to alleviate a bit of pressure off mick and phil who have been writing as a duo for 30 odd years and it's very difficult to keep on writing amazing material they've done a fantastic job um, and with davy's contribution as well i think it ends up making it more relaxed more interesting and it's the trust of there's something slightly different here um but still within the framework of what you are he pulled about mm -hmm. and that's why i think with the experience of our um musical knowledge we picked the right songs irrelevant who who wrote them they were the correct uh songs and as we're seeing from the fans response and the reviewers they're loving it so we've done something right were there any surprises while working on the album? Something you guys ran into or developed that you weren't anticipating? No, there wasn't. We we were quite cut and dry with everything. Everyone brought their ideas in. We said, "Oh, hang on, that's got to. We should work on that one. See if that works." No, that's not really. That's not really fitting with what we're doing. You know, we we were literally within ourselves quite. Uh, um what's the word i'm looking for we were we were certainly quite okay with saying yes no yes no which obviously speeds the process up as to getting into the pre-production there's nothing worse than than having a question mark over five or six songs and yeah. then eating the time away and then finding out that you're two or three songs light because you can't make a decision so <laughs> we're, we're, we're we're good like that mm -hmm good um i know that i learned a long time ago never to ask a musician or an artist what their favorite song is because it's like asking a parent to choose their favorite child right and so um so i've changed it a bit over the years and i asked what song from the album would you point to as a calling card for the rest of the album telling fans hey if you love this song you're really going to love the rest of the album hmm <laughs> It's hard being one of the songwriters because <laughs> you always feel as though your contribution um, means more. Uh, let me pick, um, I mean, Davey always writes a great opening song for the album, opening song for a new tour, and a very high energy, vibrant track that really grabs you with a great chorus. Um, I think on this particular album, I do have to say you'll never be alone just because when I wrote it with Simon, we knew we had something quite special, not only with the storyline, when we shut our eyes and listened to it musically, the music told the storyline without even you knowing what it was about. And that kind of chemistry magic doesn't happen often as a musician. So I'd like to feel that one um as a more of the proggier side the longer um track side would have the thing and you know one nation one son is a very emotional track that mick and phil wrote um that's getting a lot of attention at the moment and i can understand why again another proggy song but it has um to me a lot of a an emotional connection which i think as human beings that's what we do but certainly as hardened fans that's the special connection particularly with your i hate fans they seem to have this 
amazing emotional connection more than just a great song this that and the other they always speak about a great emotional connection so i think you know i know i balanced it out a bit but i have to give a reason for everybody otherwise you'd be a bit too selfish <laughs> <laughs> so you touched on this a couple of times already about what the advanced buzz or the buzz is I, I think we're not getting well it just actually the album just released um last week i guess it was Friday. Yeah. And so what are you, what is the buzz like? What's the feedback you're getting, especially, especially from the long-term long time fans that have, have covered you since, since like when I discovered you guys with magician's birthday, what are, what are those fans telling you about this new album? Well, that's exactly what they're saying. <clears throat> magician's birth birthday and demons and wizards. They feel as though this is sandwiched in that, category which is an amazing thing to hear considering we're 40 odd years on um but literally instead of just saying yes it's a great album they can hear the connections between those two albums particularly uh, and feel as though this is probably one of the best albums that we've made since those times and that that hits home for us that makes things oh right Come on, you know, we can't wait to get out there and play for the fans again, play uh, the Chaos and Colour tour, and, you know, it just <laughs> revitalizes you to get out there and play. Yeah, yeah it does, especially especially when you're – because fans, I'm sure you know this, especially with, with you know, um, well-established bands like you guys and well-established fans of those bands, sometimes we can get a bit jaded. We get a bit – Hmm. snarky in our comments about it and um to to see that kind of excitement come you know be still be there and especially hmm. with your latest efforts man that has got to be the best feeling in the world definitely i mean that's that's what we're wanting we're wanting the eight nine ten out of ten reviews we're wanting the fans to tell us how our music is coming across to them because they're that without fans you've got nothing Without the reviewers, all right, you can have bad reviews and still get on. You can have good reviews and still get on. But it's still nice for reviewers uh, to give you high numbers. You don't want low numbers. Of course right. you don't. But the most important thing are the fans um, who speak highly of the um, music and they give us what – because they don't write it. They're giving us a true – reflection on their feelings and emotions about the music and the only thing they've got to go on are the albums before as a reference point mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and as we've known with all the fans they like so much different stuff one person likes head first the other person hates it one person likes conquest the other person hates it so you can can't please everybody but generally on this album um i would say 90 95 percent of fans are actually raving about it. not just saying it's great uh good they're saying it's great and fantastic and that's that we'll take that any day <laughs> i bet so i see the band has booked a bunch of dates in europe starting in april um especially in germany no, they're about no 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 oh. that's just mick and phil are doing a special guest appearance uh -huh. with an orchestra with other singers there's a thing called rock meets classic which is a um a german orchestra that goes out and what they do they have half a dozen uh, singers from different bands so you might have joey tempers from europe and they might have um midger uh singing or kim wilde singing so they'll have different singers on and they'll do a small tour with that so mick and bernie are doing that Oh, That's okay. I, I missed yeah, we, that. We don't do anything till the summer festivals. Okay. And that's where, uh, that's going to be all in Europe, or are you going to come to the States for any of that? Well, it's all at Europe at the moment. At the moment, America's going bonkers over this album. I mean, the interviews that we're all doing, there's just dozens and dozens and dozens, which is great because it's going to help the cause for us to go back out there. When we went last out there, what was it, 2018, I think, supporting Judas Priest, it was so successful. It was fantastic. And, of course, then we had the pandemic. But we can't wait to get out to America again, and hopefully this album will be a springboard uh, for us to get back out there and uh, and play. 
I'm I'm sure it will. And if you do come out here, I hope to be able to catch you guys. Maybe come backstage, bump elbows with you real quick, and definitely say hello. Um, yeah. What else besides the tour is on on the band's radar for the rest of the year? There isn't anything. We're literally sitting back waiting. We're taking a couple of months off because of the 50th anniversary tour we did the back end of last year, which went down amazingly well. We had a great amount of new production. We did an acoustic set for 50 minutes, then a break. Then we did a two and a half hour show electric set, Bought wow. loads of songs we haven't played for ages. A confession, which the bands never played before, we did in the acoustic set, and the fans absolutely went mad out, mad for it. So that was a big success. So we're taking a few months off, as I said, till the summer festivals kick in. Then, unfortunately, or fortunately, we have to do the summer festival set. So oh. we can't do any chaos and colour in there. And then in the fall, September, October, we shall start doing the chaos and colour uh, tour. And um, hopefully that will put itself uh, not only in Europe, but over to uh, the States. Good deal. I'll keep an eye open on that. Are you working on anything yourself other, you know, in, in addition to Uriah Heap, are you doing any other projects that you'd like to plug? Well, I, I get asked all the time to play on people's records and this, that and the other, but I've had to turn so much stuff down because of the schedule of heat. But now I've got this big block of six months off. Yes. So I'm doing an album now with the singer out of Nazareth. Um, he's doing a solo album, Carl. And um, so I'm actually recording that tomorrow. All right. <laughs> yeah. So I'm in the studio for a couple of days recording the album there. Then um, there's a Czech Republic band. They want me and Davey actually to do a couple of tracks on their next album. And then there's another rock band in England who want me to play a couple of tracks on their album. So um, I'm doing quite a bit of recording for different people. Um, I wouldn't mind a tour. I, I, you know, I'd I love to play, you see, and I can't have six months off twiddling my thumbs and not doing anything. <laughs> so um, I'm putting the feelers out, see if I can do a nice little three, four week tour with someone um, and it's always nice to play different music with different people you know it's, it's great for the brain and it's great for your playing so we'll just see what happens over the next few months good deal well russell this was a blast i'm glad we finally got to talk i yeah, hope i get to see you later this year or early next year if you guys come stateside and uh my friend my door is always open to you if you got a special project you want to plug just let me know we'll set one of these up and we'll talk Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you, and have a great rest of the day, and stay safe and healthy, okay? And yourself. Thanks, Thank you, sir. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.